Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is August 27, 1982, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 78. On the first day of this month of August 1982, a heart-rending symbol of the Beirut Holocaust appeared in newspapers all across America. It was a wire service photograph of a nurse in hospital in East Beirut cradling a small seven-week-old baby in her left arm as she fed it from a bottle. From the tip of the tiny nose upward, the baby's head was swathed in massive bandages covering eyes and all. The little shoulders were wrapped in still more bandages. Where there should have been a pair of infant arms, there was nothing. The baby's arms had been blown off by an Israeli artillery shell landing near the Green Line separating East and West Beirut. They say a picture is worth a thousand words, but in this case the picture was worth a thousand sobs. Here was a tiny Lebanese baby, a brand new human life, ruined before it could even get started. The picture was a poignant object lesson about the senseless tragedy of war. At least that is how most people probably reacted when they saw it. But the reaction of the Begin Government in Israel was far different. When the picture was brought to their attention, they wasted not a word on trivial matters like simple human compassion, sympathy, or regret. Instead, they lodged bitter protests against the wire services and newspapers who had published the photo. There was great concern over the public relations impact on Israel resulting from that photograph. Demands were made that retractions be printed about the Israeli responsibility for the baby's grievous wounds, but to their credit wire services here refused to make any retractions. It had been established very firmly that Israeli bombardment had caused the tragedy. To most of us far from the scene, that picture of a tiny baby horribly maimed for life may appear exceptional. But the fact is that the plight of that child has been repeated countless times in the Israeli Rape of Lebanon. Recently this was illustrated by the observations of a Presbyterian minister affiliated with Princeton Theological Seminary. The minister happened to be in southern Lebanon when the invasion began on June 5 and remained in Lebanon for several weeks into the war. Recently he described what he witnessed in a talk in Ohio. The minister had seen for himself areas where the Israeli onslaught had caused not hundreds but thousands of deaths, mostly of civilians. He also described the strenuous Israeli efforts to cover up the extent of the carnage and hide it from the outside world. In more than one case Israeli bulldozers have even dug pits, shoveling in piles of bodies and covering them over. But the most nightmarish scene he described was one where a great number of children had been killed and maimed. He had come upon the scene when the cleanup had just begun. He was shown a room piled high with fingers, hands, legs, arms, and other parts of children's bodies. Here in the United States the sheer enormity of the Israeli atrocities in Lebanon is being censored out. When we hear about disgusted Israeli soldiers leaving the front and returning to Israel to protest the war, we are unable to fully understand why, but elsewhere around the world the news media are less hampered by the straitjacket of Zionist and Bolshevik censorship here in the United States, and what they are reporting is in full agreement with those personal observations by the Presbyterian Minister. For example, on August 8 the BBC reported the observations of an International Red Cross official about the carnage in Beirut. He said that more than 80 per cent of the casualties in Lebanon were civilians, and he insisted that the killing and bombing going on in Beirut was much worse than occurred generally during World War II. Two days later the BBC carried a report about relief women from Europe and New Zealand working in the Beirut battle zone. They had walked to the Green Line to protest the Israeli siege which had cut off food, fuel, and water for West Beirut. One said, These are the most horrible conditions I've seen in all our relief work around the world. And my friends, the Israelis would not even allow the children in West Beirut to leave. 
Many of the military actions ordered by the Begin Government in Lebanon can only be described as war crimes. Men who were Zionist terrorists in the 1940s control what has become the world's third most powerful military machine, that of Israel, in the 1980s. The result is what we have seen in Lebanon, state terrorism. This is military power used according to terrorist doctrine. In normal military doctrine the most successful operations are those which minimize casualties, but in military terrorism the opposite is the case. Every effort is made to multiply casualties for their own sake, with no distinction between combatants and civilians. To the terrorist death is power. Throughout the siege of Beirut we've seen the Israeli doctrine of military terrorism at work. On August 13 the Washington Post described the bewilderment created among Beirut residents by the merciless Israeli attacks. One was quoted in the words, What is the sense of all this killing? What do the Israelis want? Are they crazy? The Palestinians have said that they are ready to go, so why don't they let them? Why do they continue to bomb us like this? The answers, my friends, are all found in the doctrine of military terrorism practiced by the Bacon Government. What they want is total control through total fear, and to achieve that death and suffering is intentionally increased as much as possible. These are the policies of genocide and of true war crimes. The war crimes committed in Lebanon by the militant Israeli Zionists are terrible to contemplate, my friends, but if we do not stop and think about them we will not take seriously the plans for even greater war crimes to come. The reagan begin axes of Bolsheviks and Zionists are working fast to commit the ultimate war crime, thermonuclear war. If they succeed, the agony of Lebanon will pale beside that of America. As I say these words, the hurry-up plan to set up NUCLEAR WAR 1 is still on schedule. I first made public this shortcut war timetable six months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 72. In case it should fail or be delayed, longer-term intrigues to bring on NUCLEAR WAR are also continuing worldwide. But as of this moment, my friends, the United States Pentagon is still counting down toward mid-September to set off a surprise NUCLEAR WAR. This will be my last opportunity to report to you before Z-Day the war target date now planned in mid-September. There is a chance that something dramatic will happen to halt the plan in the days that are left. I have received late word that the anti-war coup d'etat plans, which I first reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 72, may not be totally dead after all. The Bolsheviks here did succeed in ousting the key man in that plan. General Alexander Haig two months ago, but the Bolsheviks here are not certain that they succeeded in weeding out all of Haig's men. If not, then anything could happen in the next two weeks. Even so, action to prevent the war remains a long shot at this late date. If the Bolsheviks here do succeed in setting off a surprise American nuclear first strike against Russia, I want you to be as prepared as possible. There will be absolutely no official warning to the public ahead of time if the plan is attempted, but there are a few important warning signs to watch for in the news. I want you to know what they are and what they will mean if you see them take place. I'll also reveal the exact schedule for Z-Day as now planned. My hope is that by knowing what to look for and when, you'll be able to save yourself if the attack is attempted against Russia. My three topics for this AUDIO LETTER are Topic No. 1, the surprise halt to the Beirut Holocaust. Topic No. 2, final Pentagon plans for surprise nuclear war. And Topic No. 3, the Russian surprise weapon for nuclear defense. Topic No. 1. When the Israeli invasion of Lebanon began 12 weeks ago on June 5, it was called Operation Peace for Galilee. Israel promised a nervous world that this would be only a limited operation with limited objectives. The Israelis gave their solemn promise that their armed force was to go no deeper than 40 kilometers, that is, 25 miles, into Lebanon. 
Within that limited zone close to Israel, the intent was to eliminate all Palestinian fighting forces. Begin justified the operation in the usual sanctimonious terms, telling the world that Israel had been forced into doing it. It was the only way, he said, for Israel to buy peace for its northern provinces. My friends, from start to finish, the so-called Peace for Galilee operation by Israel has been a tangle of lies. The word peace was used to give a halo to the most genocidal war yet by Israel, and the Biblical-sounding phrase, Peace for Galilee, was designed to hide the true nature of the campaign as much as possible from Christians in particular. When we Christians hear the word Galilee, we can't help thinking of our Lord Jesus Christ. The very word itself sounds sacred to us, so at a subconscious level we are tempted to feel that we dare not condemn what the Israelis are doing, and feelings like these are reinforced by Zionist influence exerted through countless churches here in America. The counterfeit Jews, the Khazar Jews, who control Israel today spend vast amounts of money to encourage counterfeit interpretations of the Bible. As a result, countless millions of well-meaning but misled Christians close their eyes to Israel's war crimes, saying, It's all in prophecy. The Zionist lies about Israel's Operation Peace for Galilee began even with the officially claimed date of the invasion. The agreed date used by the major media is June 6, when some Israeli forces went through a United Nations checkpoint. But the invasion actually began, as I pointed out in AUDIO LETTER No. 76, on June 5, not June 6. It is almost as if, by changing the date of the invasion, the Israelis are trying to avoid the Prophet Ezekiel's prophecy of doom. I quoted from that Biblical prophecy in AUDIO LETTER No. 76. The Israelis are fond of what they call creating new facts, but this is one fact they cannot change. To set the record straight once and for all, I now quote as an example from the New York Daily News for Sunday, June 6, 1982, Israeli tanks moved across the border into a Christian enclave in southern Lebanon yesterday while Israeli warplanes and gunboats pounded suspected Palestinian positions." Unquote. The date of the paper, my friends, is June 6. The reference to yesterday in the news article means June 5. Invasion of a country is a matter of fact, not words, and that invasion began with tanks crossing the border on June 5, 1982, the same day the official invasion order was signed. The Begin Government began its abominations and military desolation in its sixth year, in the sixth month of the year, on the fifth day of the month. If the Israelis have incurred the wrath of God as spelled out in Ezekiel 8, it cannot be undone by lying about the date of the invasion. The extent of the Israeli lies about the purpose of the Lebanon invasion is almost beyond belief. But what is even more disturbing is the extent to which those lies have been successfully hidden from most Americans. The whole excuse for invading Lebanon was allegedly to end Palestinian violence against northern Israel. If you believe there is even a shred of truth to that, please listen to the following quotation. It's taken from an article by columnist Anthony Lewis published in the New York Times of June 7, 1982. I now quote, For nine months not a single rocket or shell was fired by PLO gunners into Israel. When Israeli planes bombed Lebanon on April 21 for the first time since the truth started, the PLO did not respond. When there was another bombing on May 9, there was a limited response, about 100 rockets that Israel said caused no damage or casualties. Then after the massive Israeli bombing last week, the PLO responded with full-scale barrages. In short, the ceasefire kept the Galilee safe until Israel bombed Lebanon. The argument that aggressive new military action was needed to keep the rockets out turns reality upside down." End quote. My friends, it all boils down to the fact that the Reagan-Bagan axis was determined to set off war in the Middle East. The timing of the war had nothing to do with any alleged provocations by the Palestinians. Instead, it was dictated by the joint plan 
of the American Bolsheviks and the Israeli Zionists to set off nuclear war very soon. That is why the Israeli forces did not even slow down when they reached their promised limit of 25 miles into Lebanon. The merciless bombardment and siege of Beirut itself had purposes far different from those stated. The presence of PLO headquarters there simply provided a convenient excuse for what was to be the invasion of an Arab capital. Throughout the Arab world, an Israeli invasion of an Arab capital has always been seen as the ultimate taboo. Had that been the outcome of the Siege of Beirut, general war in the Middle East was virtually guaranteed, and that would have created the ideal cover to explain away the surprise eruption of nuclear war very soon. But my friends, the Beirut Holocaust at the hands of Israel ended in a surprise. The Begin Government had no intention of allowing negotiations for evacuation of the PLO to succeed. They kept turning the military screws tighter and tighter on Beirut while adding more and more demands to be met by the Palestinians. Each time the PLO confounded the Israelis by accepting demands which they had been expected to reject. As a result, time after time Reagan envoy Philip Habib warned the White House that an agreement was becoming unavoidable. Each time that happened, Begin was notified, and the Israeli Air Force started pounding Beirut again. The result, time after time, was exactly what the Israelis wanted, a brief derailment of the talks. The cycle of talks, near agreement, and disruption by Israeli bombing took up almost the entire first half of this month of August 1982. Foreign newspapers were filled with editorials condemning the bloodbath in Beirut and demanding that the United States reign in Israel. It was put more bluntly by the Morning Star, a British newspaper with Soviet ties. On August 1 the Morning Star declared that the United States on its own could end the siege of Beirut immediately if it cared to do so. But here in Washington the entity President Reagan and his spokesman just wrung their hands as if they were powerless to do anything. The carnage in Beirut went right on with a continued green light from Washington. Meanwhile there were a series of increasingly threatening growls about the Beirut Holocaust from the Russian bear. Russia's new rulers are as anti-Zionist as they are anti-Bolshevik, and they make no bones about it. On August 2 the BBC reported that Russia had condemned Israel as a barbarian committing genocide in Lebanon. On August 3, Moscow Radio charged that the planning for the takeover of Lebanon had been done by the Defense Department in Washington. On August 4, the BBC reported increasingly fierce criticism of Israel and the United States by Russia. The next day Russia called for a United Nations Security Council meeting, and at the meeting the next day described the Israeli aggression as one of insolence and craziness. The exchanges between the Russian and Israeli delegates were some of the bitterest ever seen at the United Nations. While all of this was going on in public, the Russians were also flashing warning signs by way of diplomatic channels. The Kremlin was telling the White House to call off the dogs in Beirut, but Washington was not listening. Finally the Russians decided enough was enough. In the small hours of Thursday, August 12, the entity President Reagan was awakened out of a sound sleep. He was told that Soviet President Brezhnev was waiting to speak to him on the crisis hotline. He was calling from his summer retreat in the Crimea. When Reagan picked up the phone, Brezhnev's message was short and blunt. Reagan listened as the slightly slurred words of an elderly man crackled over the phone in Russian. Then he turned to the interpreter, listening on a parallel phone. In effect the message was, Both you and your Zionist partners are deceiving yourselves. In the end we will not permit a beachhead in Lebanon by your troops. Either you stop the Zionists now, or we will fix them ourselves. What's more, we know all about your September war plan. Don't do it. Reagan, who never makes a decision on his own, could only answer that he would check into it. As a reagan brezhnev hotline conversation took place, dawn was breaking over the besieged city of Beirut. It was a dawn that had been shattered by the beginning of the most devastating bombardment yet by the Israelis. Israeli fighter bombers were shrieking overhead, diving toward the city, 
then point up as they dropped their bombs. Land and sea-based artillery shells were exploding within the city at a rate of more than one per second. The reason for the Israeli attack was very simple. A final negotiating session was scheduled for 4 o'clock that afternoon by Reagan Envoy Habib and top Lebanese officials. Habib had warned the White House that unless something was done, an agreement was a certainty. So to prevent that, the Israelis unleashed everything they had on Beirut. The raids went on for 10 hours straight from 6 a.m. until shortly after the meeting began, and it almost worked, my friends. Lebanese Prime Minister Shafiq Wazan stormed out of the meeting with Habib in a rage. He declared negotiations be suspended indefinitely, and afterwards, speaking of Reagan's man Habib, Wazan said, I have told him I cannot carry on and hold him as well as the United States responsible for the consequences. If that had been the end of it, my friends, the Reagan-Bagan axes would have achieved exactly what they wanted. With the talks broken off indefinitely, the Bagan Government would have had the excuse it wanted to proceed with its all-out invasion of Beirut. The reason it did not end there was the Brezhnev-Reagan hotline call which had taken place that morning. The Russians had threatened to fix the Zionists, and suddenly there was evidence that they were preparing to do just that. Israeli air defense radars in Lebanon on Israeli ships and in Israel itself abruptly picked up a chilling sight. More than 100 unidentified blips materialized on radars all over the region. The blips were stationary several miles up. It was a sight most radar operators in the area had never seen before, but when the reports reached Israeli and American Air Defense Headquarters, the meaning of the blips was understood instantly. For the first time in several years the Russian Space Command was making a massive show of force using its fleet of Cosmospheres. These electrogravitic weapons platforms normally hover at the fringes of the atmosphere where they are invisible to radar, but on that afternoon of August 12 over 100 of them descended straight down to within radar range over Lebanon and Israel. Bolshevik military intelligence analysts here in Washington had to make a decision fast as to whether the Russians were bluffing or meant business. Because of the known anti-war attitude of the present-day Kremlin, Russian shows of force have not always been taken seriously here, but lately the Russians have been doing things to change that. Last month I reported on a whole series of warning shots which the Russians have fired across America's bow lately. They have been designed to show that the Kremlin is prepared to use its vast military power. When that was added to the Brezhnev hotline call, analysts here got a bad case of sweaty palms. It was decided that the Beirut invasion plan would have to be aborted. Somehow the PLO evacuation negotiations had to be started up again. Suddenly all the excuses that America can't control Israel went out the window. Instead, evening news reports on August 12 led off by saying that Reagan was cracking down on Israel. There were planted stories that Reagan had called Begin and expressed outrage over the massive air raids that day. All of a sudden, after not lifting a finger for two months to stop the indiscriminate Lebanon massacre, it seemed Reagan had got religion. The following day the Lebanese Government agreed to resume the suspended talks over a PLO withdrawal. Suddenly all the previous obstacles seemed to evaporate. Within days the final agreement was struck. Barely a week later, on August 21, the first actual evacuation of PLO fighters from Beirut got underway, supervised by French troops. The turnabout by the United States and Israel was so radical and so abrupt that a scapegoat had to be found to explain it away to the public. For that reason everyone started pointing fingers at the Israeli Defense Minister Sharon. There were rumors that he alone was responsible for the insane bombardment of Beirut on August 12. All kinds of stories suddenly surfaced to the effect that Sharon always was kind of insubordinate and dangerous. It was all his fault, we were told, but Sharon said it was the fault of the Israeli Cabinet. My friends, the Russian power play saved Beirut from an invasion. But when the American Bolsheviks and Israeli Zionists caved in and gave up on the Beirut invasion plan, it was only a retreat, not a surrender. They are still as bent on nuclear war as ever, and the sooner the better, 
provided they can strike before Russia does. In the past I have described how the Bolshevik nuclear war planners always make sure they have available not just one but many possible paths to war. Having been thwarted in their Beirut invasion plan, they simply moved on to the next contingency plan. That plan involves the United States Marines who arrived two days ago in Beirut to supposedly help police the PLO evacuation. The plan is to stoke up a new crisis by creating an incident in which a number of Marines will be killed. In order to set the stage for it, the Israeli Mossad has already started creating so-called ceasefire violations which are blamed on the PLO. Last Sunday on August 22, there were news reports of an Israeli troop bus allegedly attacked by PLO guerrillas. Stories of that type are only to condition us for the planned incident to come against the United States Marines and Lebanese leaders. My friends, we have been told all sorts of lies that Israel's enemy in its so-called Peace for Galilee operation was the PLO, but on August 5 Israeli Foreign Minister Shamir revealed that the real enemy was Russia. Speaking to a group of Jewish leaders in New York City, Shamir said, Lebanon until now was dominated by the PLO in Syria, and behind them the Soviets, and he boasted, Soviet Russia doesn't play any role now in our area. But a week later Shamir found out differently when the Russian Cosmosphere threat forced a surprise end to the Beirut Holocaust. Two months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 76 I reported that the Israeli invasion of Lebanon was only part of the greater plan for nuclear war against Russia. Now United States Marines have been introduced in Lebanon with a promise by President Reagan that they will be needed no longer than 30 days. Before those 30 days are up, my friends, the Bolsheviks here intend to set off the surprise American nuclear attack against Russia. The countdown clock for the Project Z war plan, which I revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 73, is still ticking away. All preparations are now being targeted for Z Day, the day of the planned nuclear attack itself. My friends, the exact date chosen by the Pentagon for Z Day is Friday, September 17, 1982. Topic No. 2. When World War I broke out 68 years ago, world opinion was far from unanimous about who was right and who was wrong in the conflict. Many people felt that Austria-Hungary had put up long enough with harassment by the Serbs. After Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated by a Serb in Sarajevo on June 28, 1914, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia, and many people applauded. Austria-Hungary had been given a blank check by Germany to smash the Serbs. People started having second thoughts when they saw the dispute mushrooming, sucking in nation after nation. Even so, world opinion continued to maintain a great deal of goodwill toward Germany and her allies, that is, until the Battle of Louvain, Belgium. Up until the war, Louvain had been a beautiful, peaceful town. But Louvain had the misfortune to be caught in the middle between the armies of the Kaiser and those of the Allies. The Germans won the battle by virtually leveling Louvain. The battle took a gruesome toll among the helpless residents of Louvain. On all sides Louvain lay in ruins. Once beautiful buildings had been reduced to piles of rubble. The rubble had become a tomb for countless civilians who had died inside. The debris-choked streets were a mournful scene of the maimed, the bereaved, and the confused. When news about the fate of Levon reached the outside world, a wave of revulsion swept around the world. Many who had originally sympathized with the Kaiser's policies were repelled by such extreme military tactics. In terms of public opinion, Levon was the turning point of World War I. It blackened the image of Germany in a way that could never be undone. My friends, Beirut could well be the counterpart of Louvain for Israel and her powerful backer, the United States. Today as in 1914, the country that ostensibly started the war benefited at first by a large reservoir of goodwill in the world, but just as Louvain soured public opinion in World War I, Beirut has shocked the world in 1982. 
the merciless brutality and senseless killings by the Israelis in Lebanon has been symbolized by the Siege of Beirut. Israel has been rightly condemned the world over for its actions in Lebanon, and if the full extent of the agony of Lebanon ever becomes generally known, Israel's image will never recover from the shame. When Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia in 1914, it set off a chain reaction that snowballed into war among the great powers of that day. Likewise, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon to wipe out the PLO has been calculated to help set off a chain reaction leading to Nuclear War I. The joint strategy of the American Bolsheviks and the Israeli Zionists is a replay of the maneuvering that set off World War I. I have given details about that in past reports, especially in AUDIO LETTERS No. 63, 66, and 69. If need be, the Bolsheviks and Zionists, that is, the reagan begin Axis, are prepared to keep multiplying crises until America's nuclear first strike succeeds. In the Middle East, the de facto move of PLO headquarters to Syria is setting the stage for a direct confrontation soon between Israel and Syria. That will create the most dangerous proxy battle yet between client states of Russia and the United States. Already Israeli forces are preparing to try to drive out the legally present Syrians from Lebanon's Bekaa Valley. At the same time, Israeli forces are not withdrawing as the PLO evacuates from West Beirut. Instead, they are heading north. Israeli armored units are already on the outskirts of Tripoli just 20 miles short of Lebanon's northern border. As for Israel's solemn promises to turn back Lebanon to the Lebanese, nothing could be a more transparent lie. Thanks to the war, the southern third of Lebanon, including the Litani River, has now been absorbed into the so-called Free Lebanon Zone controlled by Major Haddad. Haddad is nothing but an Israeli agent, a Shabazz Goy, doing the dirty work of the Begin Government. When and if the Israelis formally withdraw from Lebanon, they will still continue to control Haddad's area, including Sidon and Tyre. And now another Israeli puppet, Mr. Basir Jamel, has emerged from the war rubble as the President-elect of Lebanon. He is nothing more than another Sadat, and he too will meet the same fate as Sadat when Israel is ready. Looking around the world, my friends, the amount of trouble now being stirred up by the Bolsheviks and Zionists is almost beyond description. For example, Bolshevik agents in Poland are stirring up new trouble to ruin government efforts to relax martial law. That keeps the Warsaw regime on the defensive, unable to appear as anything but a bad guy. Or consider Central America and the Caribbean. Panama is now being destabilized, beginning with a recent surprise resignation so-called of Panama's President. The plan to create an apparent threat to the Panama Canal is moving right along. Meanwhile, Congress has recently passed a special Tonkin Gulf-type resolution aimed at Cuba. It frees Reagan's hands to take military action against Cuba, just as the Tonkin Gulf Resolution freed President Johnson to widen the war in Vietnam. And then there is Asia, where war between India and Pakistan is targeted for around November 1982. Middle East intrigues and many more worldwide are in the works as a result of the Bolshevik program to balkanize the world, but all those intrigues will no longer be necessary if the Project Z shortcut war plan succeeds. Very soon they plan to set off Nuclear War I as a total surprise, and they intend to make it look like a gigantic accident. In AUDIO LETTER No. 73 five months ago, I outlined the overall war plan of Project Z. But as a practical matter, the most important thing you need to know now is how the war is being planned to begin. You need to know what warning signs to watch for and when. For that reason, I will now describe in detail how the Pentagon war planners intend to set off the war. Only a few hints of what is about to happen will be visible in public, but if you see them happening, you will know what they mean. The plan for an American nuclear first strike against Russia has been in gestation for over four years now. I first reported on America's secret shift toward a first strike nuclear strategy in AUDIO LETTERS No. 36 and 37. The prime objective of the initial American nuclear strike is still as I first made public in AUDIO LETTER No. 37. The objective is to knock out all of Russia's complex of space bases. 
Those are logistic lifelines, the Achilles heel of the Russian space triad of strategic weapons. If the Bolsheviks here can put Russia's space triad out of action, Russia will no longer be unconquerable in nuclear war, and so the initial attack against Russia's space triad bases is to be followed immediately by an all-out American nuclear attack. Bolshevik war planners here, the hardliners, have been putting together the pieces of the military machine needed to do the job for years now. I have reported on these various pieces of the overall military picture over the course of many past reports. Now all the factors in the Bolshevik military equation are coming together as they prepare for imminent nuclear war. In AUDIO LETTER No. 73 I describe the new secret American superweapon that is the key to the attack plan. It is the Phantom Warplane, the most radical breakthrough achieved by the so-called Stealth Program. Unmanned Phantom Warplanes are being deployed now to their attack bases in northern Norway, eastern Turkey, and Xinjiang Province, China. These bases are protected from Cosmosphere attack by high-power lasers. The lasers are equipped with a new super-sensitive aiming device known as SEER C -E -I -R, for Computer Enhanced Infrared. As I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 72, a SEER-equipped laser shot down a Russian Cosmosphere over New Jersey some seven months ago. Its effectiveness is therefore a proven fact, but just to make sure the Russians have not developed a defense against these special lasers, another Cosmosphere was blasted out of the sky over the New York City vicinity just three days ago. It created a huge high-speed fireball, described in the New York Times yesterday as a possible asteroid burning up. When the American Phantom warplanes are launched into Russia on Z-Day, they will be swarming toward only six primary and about a dozen secondary targets. The six primary targets are the Russian space bases. Four of these are the rocket bases known as Cosmodrones at Baikonur, Tiritam, Plesetsk, and Kapustin Yar. The other two space bases are the sprawling Cosmosphere facilities at Semipalatinsk and Novosibirsk. As for the dozen or so secondary targets, these are the complex of Russian flying ABM bases. The system consists of anti-missile particle beam weapons carried aboard converted Tu-144 supersonic transports. The transports were mysteriously removed from service in June 1978 for conversion to anti-missile defense. I reported that this was underway in AUDIO LETTER No. 54. Today the system is fully operational. The Bolshevik war planners here in the United States want to knock them all out if possible, to make the American follow-up attack more devastating. Of all these targets, the two which have become most important of all are the two Cosmosphere bases, the new Russian Super Heavy Cosmospheres, which I first reported on in AUDIO LETTER No. 64, foreshadow the day when rockets will be obsolete. If the Cosmosphere bases survive, the Bolshevik war plan is doomed to failure. There is only one satisfactory geographic location from which to launch a strike against the Russian Cosmosphere areas. As long ago as AUDIO LETTER No. 37, I revealed that this key location is Sinkian Province, China. The Bolsheviks here must have access to Sinkian Province at all costs. That is why, four months after I revealed this, the so-called Carter Administration unexpectedly dumped Taiwan on December 15, 1978. That day Washington suddenly announced full diplomatic relations with Peking. With Nuclear War I approaching fast, the Red Chinese once again used their leverage this month against Taiwan. Peking has been pressuring the Reagan Administration to publicly commit itself to cutting off all arms sales to Taiwan. As recently as August 13, Reagan's alleged final offer was a refusal to do that, but then the Red Chinese told Washington that if the United States did not agree, the Chinese would shut down the American stealth base in Shenkian Province. Four days later, on August 17, a joint communique was released in Peking and Washington. It declared that there is only one China, that Taiwan is part of it, and that the United States will gradually discontinue arms sales to Taiwan. The old Reagan campaign pledge to stand by Taiwan was scrapped in order to prevent a last-minute hitch in a stealth attack plan. 
According to the Pentagon plan, the unmanned Phantom warplanes will take off from their various bases at carefully predetermined intervals. Their launch times will be adjusted in order to make them all arrive at their targets simultaneously. As I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 73, these robot bombers will be flying blind on a one-way trip like mechanical kamikaze planes, but thanks to their advanced new type inertial guidance systems, they're expected to all arrive right on schedule. As they fly through Russian airspace, they will be invulnerable to detection either visually or by radar. The light distorting electromagnetic fields, which I described in AUDIO LETTER No. 73, will also render Russian beam weapons useless for defense. Anti-aircraft missiles, even those which follow the heat trail of a plane, will also be useless. If any missile or jet fighter got close to a Phantom warplane, its electronics would be hopelessly deranged by the invisibility field. As if all this were not enough, each Phantom warplane will also be following a pre-programmed zigzag course into Russia. The Bolsheviks here believe that this will make any attempt to fire at the stealth planes with anti-aircraft guns very ineffective. All things considered, the Project Z war planners are confident that enough Phantom warplanes will reach their targets to do their job. Converging from all directions, the invisible robot warplanes will all arrive at their targets at essentially the same time. Countdown clocks in all the warplanes will be programmed to reach zero at the same instant. When they do, a 24 megaton hydrogen bomb will explode aboard each and every Phantom warplane. The attack is planned for nighttime when the Soviet Union is asleep. Around the Space Triad bases and Tu-144 bases, night will turn into day as man-made stars erupt into life. That will be the moment which an American satellite parked high over the Indian Ocean has been watching for. It is the attack confirmation sensor which I described in AUDIO LETTER No. 75. This was the mysterious military payload of Space Shuttle 4 placed in geostationary orbit by an auxiliary rocket. When the H-bombs detonate over their targets, the Air Force satellite will detect the flashes of infrared, ultraviolet, and X radiation. Instantly the satellite will flash a signal confirming the attack to listening stations on Earth. The attack confirmation signal will confirm that the initial critical surprise attack by stealth planes has succeeded. That will be the signal for all the rest of the Project C nuclear war plan to go into motion. But as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 73, Project Z is a super-secret war plan unknown to all but a few top leaders of the military in America. Therefore, the attack confirmation signal will not be routed through standard existing channels. Instead, the Bolshevik war planners here have created a special new command for the purpose. It's called the Air Force Space Command. It is to begin operations officially on September 1, just in time to get ready for the planned nuclear attack on September 17. The new Space Command is located in Colorado Springs, Colorado. There it will feed special information to NORAD headquarters, also located there. When the Air Force Space Command receives the attack confirmation signal from the Indian Ocean satellite, the follow-up attack will begin. First, a coded signal will be flashed to the Minuteman TX commanders in our northern tier of states and certain other locations. The Minuteman TX is America's real mobile missile, now fully deployed on our railroads as I first revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 55. In AUDIO LETTER No. 60, I reported that they are also accompanied by high-speed missiles called ACMs. When the coded signal arrives from the newly created Space Command, the ACMs will zoom upward to the fringes of the atmosphere. There they will detonate special cobalt ionization bombs. The resulting electron storm in the upper atmosphere of the United States is expected to temporarily disable any Cosmospheres on patrol. With the Cosmospheres momentarily deranged, the mobile Minuteman TX missiles will be launched right past them at Russia. When the American ACMs detonate their bombs high over our own country, it will also create another effect. It is called Electromagnetic Pulse or EMP. EMP can knock out communications, 
fry telephone lines and cause power blackouts by overloading power transmission lines. In AUDIO LETTER No. 66 I described how the Bolsheviks here planned to use this effect to trigger an all-out American nuclear strike against Russia. They have been programmed to consider an EMP episode to be evidence in itself that America is under nuclear attack. America's entire nuclear triad, missiles, bombers, and submarines, will then launch a supposed retaliatory strike against Russia. There will be no need for a normal White House order to attack. There has been no official admission that this is in store for us, of course. Even so, this reprogramming of our nuclear forces is now being hinted at by discussion of a new military doctrine. It's called Launch Under Attack. Military analysts describe it as warning by loss of warning. That is exactly the concept I made public over a year ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 66. My friends, if all goes according to plan, there will be no warning to the American public by Reagan Administration officials. They are counting on surprise to make their nuclear surprise attack on Russia successful. They aren't about to throw that surprise away by telling you about it first. So it will be up to you to watch events for yourself and to make your best judgment based on what you know. I've already mentioned some of the visible signs that the plan is still on track up to now. There remain two more major signals to watch for in the days ahead. If you see them, you'll know that the American nuclear first strike against Russia is about to be attempted. First, watch for news of a major nuclear false alarm sometime during the first half of September. This will mean a full-scale dry run has been carried out involving the brand new Air Force Space Command. By describing the exercise afterward as a false nuclear alert, the war planners will be setting the stage for an alleged accidental war. The final warning will come as the nuclear attack itself is beginning. My friends, the present Pentagon schedule calls for the preliminary Phantom Warplane H-bombs to explode at 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, Friday, September 17, 1982. At that time, Virtually all of Russia will be in darkness. When the Indian Ocean satellite signal arrives confirming the attack, it will be followed within a minute or so by the EMP episode I described. If you are watching TV or listening to the radio, there will suddenly be horrendous static and possibly permanent damage to your receiver. There may also be a power blackout. Your telephone may go dead. If those things happen, my friends, don't wait for any air raid sirens. What's happening is that the American follow-up nuclear strike against Russia is being launched. Retaliating missiles from Russia can be expected here soon afterward. If you are in a prime coastal target area, the Russian counter-strike will hit your area within minutes. The Russian short-range underwater launch missiles which were planted along our shores and the Great Lakes in 1976 and 1977 are still there. Their short flight time, unfortunately, will leave at most a few minutes to take cover after the EMP episode. ICBMs fired from Russia will take approximately 24 minutes to reach targets near the Canadian border. If you live farther south, it will take several more minutes, but if your area happens to be targeted by a Russian submarine launch missile, the time could be cut to less than 10 minutes in many cases. Russia's moon bases and cosmospheres overhead both armed with their charged particle beam weapons can still do great damage to major cities and United States military installations, but these cause no fallout. Topic No. 3. My friends, if the events I have described take place, it will mean that the Bolshevik war planners in the Pentagon are going ahead with their attack plan, but that does not mean that it will necessarily succeed. As I say these words, there is preliminary intelligence that the Russians may have a surprise up their sleeve for the Bolsheviks. This is actually the second attempt by the Bolsheviks here to set off Nuclear War I, as my older listeners know. The first attempt in late January 1980 was a disastrous failure. It led indirectly to leaks about the stealth program about six months later. Now they are trying again with better weapons. But in the meantime, Russian weaponry has also kept on advancing. As a result, 
There is no way to predict how the Bolshevik-triggered American first strike will turn out. Last month I reported that the Super Spy satellite launched by the Third Space Shuttle in March had detected something puzzling in Russia. The puzzle consists of large numbers of small domed installations arranged in rings around strategic Russian targets. There is a ring of these domes around each Cosmodrome and around each Cosmosphere base in particular, but opinion is divided as to what they are. Some analysts believe they are more or less conventional anti-aircraft batteries with domed enclosures. Others think they are missile batteries. Still others vote for beamed weapons of some kind, either lasers or particle beams. The only agreement up to now is that they are defensive weapons of some kind. That is indicated by their arrangement in protective rings around certain strategic targets. There is one other guess as to what the domes are. It is a minority opinion so far which is not accepted by the top American Bolshevik war planners, but my own information indicates that it is the right guess. Each dome, my friends, contains a weapon known as a rail gun. Rail guns have been under study for a number of years in both Russia and the United States. A rail gun is a kind of super high-speed cannon. The projectile moves down a track between a pair of long conducting rails. When the gun is fired, an incredibly powerful electromagnetic field races down the length of the rails, welding them together as it goes. The projectile is forced along ahead of the fast-moving electromagnetic field, leaving the muzzle with incredible velocity. Railgun muzzle velocities of at least 25,000 feet per second have been achieved. This is faster than the Space Shuttle in Earth orbit. Here in the United States, Railguns are still curiosities. A railgun can only be fired once because the rails weld themselves together, and the projectile has to be non-conducting. It can't be steel or other metal. But to the Russians, faced with a Phantom warplane threat, railguns may be the only answer. The Russians have the ability to aim railguns at our Phantom warplanes using psychoenergetic range finding which I revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 42 and a non-conducting projectile fired at astronomical velocities could penetrate the stealth plane's invisibility field. The use of rail guns to defend against the Phantom warplanes will be a nasty surprise to the Bolsheviks here if they carry out their war plan, but as of now the war plan is still on track. As a result, time may well be running out for the United States of America as we know it. Now it's time for my last-minute summary. My friends, in this AUDIO LETTER I've tried to prepare you as fully as possible to recognize the signs of imminent nuclear war. The anti-war coup d'etat plan of General Alexander Haig, which I revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 72, collapsed with his forced resignation in June. Since that time it has been full speed ahead toward NUCLEAR WAR ONE. The Rush Rush New War Timetable, which I also revealed six months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 72, is still on schedule. Target date, September 17, 1982. Just 12 days ago on August 15, the Los Angeles Times broke a bombshell story about these war plans. The syndicated article revealed that an elaborate secret new protracted nuclear war plan is now ready. In fact, my friends, this plan is already operational. The article says, quote, According to a member of the Administration, the plan would contemplate nuclear warfare for as long as six months." Unquote. The plan also draws attention to the present vulnerability of our military command, control, and communications system. The article quotes a Reagan staffer in the words, "...the system might survive 15 minutes of nuclear war." Unquote. My friends, this very vulnerability is the key to the Bolshevik plan to set off the war by EMP episode I have described. The fear over all this is so great that three days ago the Pentagon announced extreme measures to try to squelch the debate. Our Bolshevik Defense Secretary, Caspar Weinberger, has sent out 70 letters to key newspaper editors here and abroad to try to defuse the criticism. Meanwhile, the plan to set up nuclear war soon is still on track. In the past, I have reported that Russia's new anti-Bolshevik rulers regard America as Babylon, wallowing in ill-gotten wealth and degeneracy. 
If the American Bolsheviks are successful in forcing nuclear war upon the Kremlin, the fall of Babylon may well be at hand. As the Angel of Revelation revealed to John the Apostle, the cries may soon ring out around the world, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is Thy judgment come. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.